Hey guys, and thanks for joining our Corbett Real Estate Advisors Real Estate Investment Training. My name is Chad Corbett. I'm the team owner at Corbett Real Estate Advisors, and uh, a lot of we do a lot of coaching with people that are just getting into investing. Since we we often represent investors and in, and in the disposition of, of assets, we get a lot of beginning investors calling. Um, we also work with a lot of seasoned investors that are way more successful than we've been that can still learn because um, they're using you know kind of a haphazard approach at, at building a portfolio and with just a little bit of coaching and a little bit of structure um, and some financial knowledge and, and finance strategies, they can actually grow their portfolio way faster than they, they have in, in previous years. So I wanted to put this presentation together both for the agents on my team as well as the, the clients that we work with. So I'm going to be talking to two groups of people in this. Um, I think it's it's good for the investors to know how our agents are trained and it's good for the agents to know what our investors are looking for. So this, this video should be mutually beneficial to both. Um, first, let's talk a little bit about who we are. Uh, I just told you my name's Chad. I'm, I'm the team leader. I'm a, a real estate investor, a realtor, a consultant, a coach. I've got experience uh, licensed in West Virginia, Tennessee, uh, Virginia, and Hawaii. I've sold real estate all across the country and uh, done a little bit of everything you can do in real estate. Um, my company now, Corbett Real, Corbett real Estate Advisors, uh, has a mission of helping help, to help others improve their quality of life through real estate. Um, you know, for a first-time home buyer, that has a much different meaning than it does for a, a seasoned investor. But regardless of you know where you are in your investing or home buying, it, we can we can always help you improve your quality of life through real estate. Whether that's you know producing more cash flow, uh, streamlining your investments, switching your strategy, or just buying a home for the first time, uh, that's something where we can always accomplish. Uh, you can see here. This is a video, so I won't go to, go to the live link, but you can click here to see our about page, and uh, that'll give you a little more information on our core values, our mission statement, and uh, just who I am if we haven't met yet. So let's jump right in. Um, we're first going to talk about re different strategies that real estate investors employ, um, the first being a buy and hold or a landlord. <clears throat> We'll go through each of the, kind of the broad categories, and this is this is really geographically confined. I mean, this is not speaking nationwide. We're actually bringing this kind of down to the micro level of here in Roanoke. Uh, so the first type of your buy and hold investor or landlord is a low income rental investor. Now those are going to be the rougher areas of town, and you know you're going to have a lower tenant profile. People that are that don't really give a damn if they miss rent. And some, you know, professional con artists and people who have a lot of evictions on their history. Um, that's typically going to be a fifty thousand or less house after even including repairs, which is going to yield about a fifteen percent cap rate. Now, if you're not sure what cap rate, what what I mean by cap rate, uh, we'll we'll learn that later in in this video. It's a capitalization rate. It's a, a common measure used for uh, valuing real estate. The next would be a nice neighborhood landlord. This is going to be a you know working class, middle class to working class neighborhood where most of the most of the homes on the street or the neighborhood are, you know, in a better school system. Most are owner occupant homes versus rentals. You're going to attract you know young families, divorced individuals, and lifetime renters that will take care of your property. Typically, they're going to stick around for a lot longer. You can charge a little higher rent. So these homes are going to be in the fifty thousand to a hundred thousand range, and you're going to see a yield of you know like a nine to fifteen percent cap rate on on these properties. And again, we'll we'll get a little deeper into those returns later. Um, this is what I call the should have bought something else landlord. Uh, these are the people that go to the nicest areas of the town, like in in our instance here, you know, someone that goes to. Cave Spring or South Roanoke and just overpays for a house, to be frank. Um, you know, those are people that get a kick-ass tenant profile. They're going to get a, a middle class and up, young professionals, you know, working people who make tons of money. They're going to cycle through those pretty quickly because those, those are the same people that buy homes. You know, those are your first-time home buyers. 
These are going to be at a price point of 100000 plus, and most investors that employ this strategy, they're going to make less than a nine cap on, on the investment, and they're banking on appreciation, which is always reckless. Because if, if you're buying a cash, you know, an, an, an asset as a true investment, then you're buying that on, on you know, on, uh, as an investment. And if you're banking on appreciation, that may or may not ever happen. Our, our market here in Roanoke is relatively flat, so we don't see the big peaks or the, or the low valleys that, that other markets in the United States see. But we also remain relatively flat because of that. So if, if, you're, if you're thinking of buying real estate on appreciation alone, you should rethink your strategy. Um, you don't want to be a should have bought something else investor. Uh, the the last class of, of invest the, the buy and hold investors is multifamily. Now, by definition, anything with more than one unit is a multifamily. But by uh, also by de definition, single family or residential property is one through four units. When I think of true multifamily, I think of four units or larger. Um, these are going to be all over the city. You know, you have variance in, in neighborhoods, variance in tenant profiles, and really that's going to depend on the asset class. So uh, you, you can see here you have A, B, C, and D in, in commercial asset classes. A class A is going to be a newer property in awesome shape in a great part of town. B is going to be a step below that. C is a step below that. D is going to be about the worst you can imagine. So depending on what your asset class is, um, you can usually see here in Roanoke between an 8 and a 15 cap on, on your multifamily investments. Next, we'll talk about um, the rehab or the fix and flip investors. Uh, your first type is your seasoned investor. These are the guys that are doing this all year round. It's it's you know that they're they're highly experienced in flipping homes. Um, they're typically going to be paying cash or using private money. Some will be using hard money, and we'll talk about those financing sources later too. But um, they they've got their strategy nailed down. They know what works. They know exactly what sells homes. Uh, most of those guys are using an ARV or after repair value times 70% minus repairs. So that's a formula that's it's it's hard to tell when it actually dates back to. That's kind of the old school formula. So say you have a hundred thousand dollar house <clears throat> that needs twenty thousand in repairs. You know, ARV is your hundred is one hundred thousand times 70% is 70, and you back out the 20, you could pay 50 for that house. And, and we'll go through that a little more in depth too. But these are guys that are typically doing four or more homes a year, and they have a, a, a rigid strategy in place. They have a staff or a team that helps them because there are a lot of moving parts in, in employing that strategy. Uh, the next type of rehabber, I call these the mom and pops. These are the people that beat my ass on MLS all the time because they really – they are typically using cash they've saved up or a retirement account. They'll price me out of the market or any other investor out of the market because they just don't have the experience. They, they underestimate repair costs for the most part and usually don't find out until they're deep into it that by not having a solid strategy and not having you know a, a really good understanding of the process that, that they usually make marginal profits or sometimes unfortunately even lose money. Um, these people will do one to four flips a year. You know, once you get above four a year, you kind of leave the mom and pop class. You're, you're, you're running a business at that point. Um, most of these people are doing it, a husband, wife, you know, helping each other, doing the, the, you know, meeting with contractors and all that stuff. And if, if they do have a staff, they're just starting to build that. Your next class is the tire kicker, and unfortunately, this is the majority of people that we speak with as, as real estate professionals. You know, we're, we're kind of the front lines for the people who are just getting into investing or think they want to get into investing. They've gone online or, you know, bought a course, bought a book, and, and think, holy crap, you know, this is going to be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit my job and start flipping houses. And unfortunately, it's not as easy as, as the gurus might make you think it is. So this is typically the guy that calls and he has no idea what his strategy is. He has no idea what his financing options are. And if he doesn't meet the right person that can give him some professional guidance, he's probably going to lose his ass in real estate. And, and hopefully he hasn't quit his job by the time he does that. Um, so that's our tire kicker. And not to offend anybody here, but you know, if, if any of these things struck a chord with you, 
you should probably think about putting a strategy in place and getting somebody to help you with this. And we're happy to do that for you. Um, the next part is how do investors value real estate? Now, this is something that I'm sure a lot of people watching, especially if you're a seasoned investor, you know, we could debate for, for weeks on this and I could write an entire book on this. So keep in mind, I'm going to try to condense this down and, and keep it as short as possible. So there's a few ways you can you can value real estate. Uh, the first is a sales comparison approach. Now this is the way an appraiser would value a retail deal. So you're going to use a CMA, which is a comparative market analysis, or what we actually use is an MAA or a market absorption analysis. There's a lot of different reasons we do that, but I believe that the market absorption analysis gives you a, a much better pulse on the market. A CMA is kind of looking in the rearview mirror and an MAA is more of a 360 degree view of what sold, what didn't sell, what's currently on the market competing with you, and what are the prices. So it gives you, you can best position yourself in the market. Um, the sales comparison approach is, you know, that's pretty much retail value. No investor is ever going to pay that. However, it is useful for some of the other formulas that we're going to use. It's useful in establishing the after repair value. Um, so your, your sales comparison approach will help you get to the ARV or the after repair value. And then that'll, that'll help you when you're, when you're using the ARV formula. So uh, the traditional way to value flip properties is ARV times 70% minus repairs. And that's kind of a safe price. Now, because of the mom and pops and because of some of the inexperienced investors that price the market up, what we found here lately at the end of the, the correction, at, the, at this part in the cycle, at least in my business, I can pay as much as 80% minus repairs and uh, still be in a, still have a, a good profit margin of, of 18% or more. Now, I will say that that's with me putting commissions back in and selling my own property. So if you're not a licensed agent, you, know, you may stick with that 70% minus repairs so you can afford the, the acquisition and disposition fees. Um, this is most commonly used by rehabbers. The landlord's going to look at this totally differently. Um, and you can see here that, that I, I use the ARV times 80% minus repairs. And I'd say on average, I have about a 20% return. You know, our, our flips range anywhere from an 18 to probably 24% return, but I'd say 20 is a safe average. So as an example, if you have a house that in perfect condition is worth 150000 and you multiply that times 80, that means you've got 120. You back out your repairs of 35, which is pretty pretty common for a home of this this uh, this range. So you could pay 85 grand for that house and still make at least an 18% return. Um, now this is an example using my numbers. It could be a little lower. Um, a lot of people are going to have lower repairs than I have, and I'll tell you why later because I use. Uh, only class A contractors that I don't have to babysit. Um, the next valuation approach is the as-is approach. This was actually taught to me by a guy who had, he's flipped over a thousand houses, um, done a lot of wholesaling, so he would basically say, all right, well, what is the property worth? If I were to put it on MLS today, what could I expect to sell it for? And whatever that number is, is your as-is value. So no matter how bad of condition the home is in, what would somebody pay for it today? And once you establish as is value, just simply multiply that times 75% and that gives you a safe investor price. Um, this is actually gonna leave a little more meat on the bone than, than the other strategy. Uh, this is common, this is actually a good way to get to a wholesale price. And if you're not familiar with wholesaling, that's when somebody buys a home from a private seller and then sells it to an investor off market you essentially just sell the paper, you sell the rights to the contract. Um, so there's a spread in there. So if you buy something at, at the, something that's worth 100000 if you put it on MLS right now, that same house is probably worth 150 fixed up or ARV. But we're going to look at 100000 as is times 75%. You could pay 75 for that house. Using the last formula we just went over, you could pay 85 for the same house. So there's a $10,000 spread in here using this formula. So if you're thinking about wholesaling homes to kind of raise capital for your flips or, or to, to build your buy and hold portfolio, this is a really good approach to use. It's just as is times 75%.
The other thing I really love about this is it's not complicated for a beginner. If you're out in the field and you're nervous, you're meeting with your first seller or meeting with a realtor, you know, you can quickly know exactly what you can pay. There's, this is kind of one of those, there's enough meat on the bone. It's hard to really make a mistake formulas. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is the income approach. Now this is, I'm going to try not to get too deep and, and, you know, confuse everybody here, but this is how seasoned investors look at, at investments. Um, a lot of these are going to be more geared toward the landlords, like the, the first three that we went through are, are geared toward flips. These are going to be geared more toward buy and hold. So the first is a cap rate, and I didn't write this out, but cap is, is abbreviation of capitalization rate. And there's, I'll show you some resources at the end of the presentation where you can learn more about this. But a cap rate is essentially <clears throat> your net operating income divided by the price of the asset, the price you paid or the price you're expecting to pay will give you the cap rate. So for example, if you have a house that's $50,000 and it rents for eight fifty dollars a month, you're going to take your gross scheduled rent or what you're supposed to be paid per month, eight fifty dollars times 12, so you have $10,200 in gross scheduled rent annually. If you multiply that times 75, and the reason I use 75, that's just a rule of thumb that has always served me well. You know, if you take the whole 10-2 and you don't back out something for repairs, vacancy, and credit loss, meaning uncollected rent, then you're probably going to have a nasty surprise down line. So I'll take the, the gross scheduled income times 75%, and that gives me a rough net operating income. Now, it's worth mentioning, to get to an actual net operating income, you would need to have an, uh, an exact, you know, you need, really, you'd need two years of profit and loss statements to build a, your, your expense, your, all your expenses, and then back that out from your go, gross scheduled rent. Since we don't usually have that luxury when we're buying foreclosure properties or meeting with sellers uh, or homes never been rented before, we use this rule of thumb. So that that additional 25% of this income is going to be used to pay for deferred maintenance, vacancy, credit loss, and those things to cover you. A lot of guys don't take this step, and they find out too late in the game that they've got a they've got a dud. So, anyways, uh, the net 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 the NOI is 7650 divided by the $50,000 that we're going to pay for this asset. So that's a 15 cap investment. Now that may mean nothing to you if you're new to investing. Um, so a lot of people say, well, Chad, you know, I, I understand that now, but what's a good cap rate? What should I su shoot for? If it's, and I'll, I'll kind of go in reverse from the way I've, I've got it here. So the example I gave you is a 15% cap rate. That's usually just pro forma. By the time you back out vacancy, credit loss, um, you know, a six month eviction process, a lot of times a 15 cap isn't real. You know, it's it's in those neighborhoods where you can get per homes at that, that low of a price. There's usually a lot of deferred maintenance, a lot of vacancy, a lot of credit loss, a lot of problems and headaches. Um, so if if that's the, the field, you know, if you want to play in that space, if you think low income landlord is where you want to be, just make sure you, you really do a good job at, at um, you know, screening your tenants and and, you know, take care of your property. And you can keep this number in a realistic range. It, it could realistically be 15, but you can't just get a 15 cap by sitting on your hands and, and not doing anything. Um, a 10 to 15% cap rate, I think, is, is a realistic range for single family homes. Um, 8 to 10% is good for multifamily, not really for single family homes, unless it does have appreciation potential. If you can buy something that has, it's in great shape and you can get it for pennies on the dollar, then I'll, I'll take that statement back. If it's below a seven cap, you should probably look at alternative investments. Um, I, all the work and risk that goes into real estate investing is probably not worth it at a seven cap. Especially, I mean, if, if you're buying a seven cap and hoping for appreciation, that's a dud. Just forget about it. Walk on and find the next deal. So, <laughs> believe me, it's it's hard to compress that conversation down into just a couple of minutes. If you if you want to learn more about cap rates, I'll give you a resource at the end, or you can always call me and and we'll we'll unpack that a little more. 
The next income approach is a gross rent multiplier. Um, gross rent multiplier, like the traditional in the traditional sense, is your scheduled gross rent divided by your price gives you your your GRM or gross rent multiplier. Um, I don't really like the traditional model. If uh, one thing I do like, uh, Dallas at uh, REI of Virginia, he teaches rent times thirty minus repairs. That, in my experience, is really tough to get. And I have bought houses using this formula. However, it's they're they're far and few between, especially if you're looking on MLS. I, I think it's safe to say you probably you, there maybe maybe one of a thousand on MLS might fit this formula. Um, the cool thing about this, it's very simple and, and you can use it in the field. It's very quick. If someone's going to, if, if, you know, if you're looking at a home, you know, you could rent for eight fifty a month, multiply that times 30, estimate your repairs, back those out. You know, you can pay 10, five for that house. Um, I've actually bought homes in this scenario that would rent for eight fifty, and I've bought them for less than $10,000. So it, it is out there. It's not like you're chasing a unicorn, but it's not something you're going to come across every day. So depending on the, and the, the velocity you're trying to build your portfolio, that may or may not be a wise formula for you to follow. Um, there are some people in, in the real estate investors of Virginia group that are renting in a little higher neighborhoods and they use a rent times 50 minus repairs formula. Um, I think that's a little more realistic. Uh, you could take the same house that rents it at 850 times 50 minus your 15,000 in repairs and you could pay 27.5 for that house. So you're going to find a lot more deals at 27.5 than you are at 10.5. If you look on MLS today, you might see one or two that are under 10,000 and there's probably, you know, half a dozen or so that are under 30,000. Um, so that's just a quick rundown on gross rent multiplier. Next is cash on cash return. Um, notice down here, <laughs> I, I don't use this. I just wanted to show you guys how different people will value real estate because you're going to hear a lot of opinions from a lot of different gurus. But cash on cash return is essentially cash flow divided by cash invested. Um, so in, in the same example, if you have a hundred and fifty thousand dollar home and you get a mortgage for thirty, you put thirty thousand down and mortgage a hundred and twenty, you can rent that for eight fifty a month. That's ten thousand two hundred annually. So you divide your debt service by the mortgage to get your cash flow, or excuse me, you subtract debt service from. Uh, anyways, so your cash flow is one hundred and thirty point fifty four or fifteen sixty six annually. Um, so you're looking at eighty six thirty three fifty two is your cash flow divided by 30,000. So this investment's only a 5% cash on cash return. The reason we don't use this is we haven't accounted for expenses. So that 5% could be completely destroyed by the need for a new roof or a furnace or air conditioner going bad. Um, but I just wanted to show you that because that's, that is how some guys value their, their assets. This is one, the, the, the per door income is what I call it, because there's, there's a ton of guys here in Roanoke that, and many of them are on my buyer's list, that they don't know what cap rates or cash on cash or internal rate of return. They don't know what any of that is, and they, frankly, they don't care, and that's fine, because a lot of them are super successful investors. Um, so anyway, a lot of guys are looking, you know, they just have a goal of making two, three, four hundred dollars per door, and that's all that really matters to them. And, and uh, understand, I, I'm not being critical because these guys are, most of them are way wealthier than I am. Um, it, it is effective for them. So you can do something as simple as that. Like, Chad, you know, if you can just get me into investments where I can make $200 a door, I'm happy. And believe me, you'll have a lot less competition if you're comfortable making $200 a door. Um, and, and we have a lot, of, a lot of different ways we can get you to that. I mean, if we apply some leverage... We can buy almost any house and make $200 a door. Um, how investors estimate repair costs. This is something that can take years to learn. So what I've learned and, and trying to, to really condense this down into a teachable format is that you almost can't. You know, this is something because of the variance in materials used, labor used, um, 
design elements of, of the home, uh, square footage. I mean, there's just so many variables that go into repair costs that I, I couldn't possibly teach it on, on something like this. So what I've done is just boiled it down to three, three levels of, of repair costs. So for the DIY guy that's going to do the work himself, he might be a contractor, have a lot of experience, you could probably do that for seven to nine bucks a square foot. If you get on Craigslist and find a tradesman or a contractor who likes, uh, really enjoys old Milwaukee and might show up three out of five days of the working week, uh, you know, you can, with, with proper babysitting, you can get work done. You can get quality trades. Um, you just have to do a lot of, of, you basically do the general contractor's job and you babysit those guys. And you can do that for about 10 to 15 bucks a square foot. If you choose to take a more hands-off approach and hire somebody that can manage the entire project and understand exactly what you want, and you never have to lift a finger, you never have to go to the job site, you get what you pay for. And this is actually the way I do my flips. I, I have a, an incredible class A contractor. Uh, you know, During the acquisition, we do a scope of work. I lay out everything for him. I say, here's what I want done. Here's a materials list. And I walk away. And usually 21 to 30 days later, he calls me and says, hey, come take a look. And it's perfect. And I've, not once have I ever had to go back and say, you got to change this or you got to redo something. And you're you're probably going to have a hard time finding that guy and as much as I would would love to help I'm probably not going to share who my guy is <laughs> um, but anyway that's going to run you you know 15 to 30 bucks a square foot and the reason there's such a range here 7 to 9 10 to 15 or 15 to 30 it's going to depend on the job so if you've got a carpet and paint rehab you know that's obviously going to be on the low end if it needs all new mechanicals electrical HVAC roof windows you're going to hit that 30 bucks a square foot um, so th this is something that um, we can help you connect with trades and, and you know, we'll, we'll keep you from, from learning through mistakes. You know, we can help share experiences and stories and, and we can connect you with the right people that will take care of you. Um, this is another subject. I could write a book on this. So we're going to touch on how investors finance their real estate investments. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Cash. Go make money somewhere else and then bring it into real estate. There's not much to talk about here. Um, line of credit or HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit. This is the next best thing to cash. You, Most people who have a line of credit have a checkbook, so they can just simply strike a check for any asset they want. doesn't matter. The line of credit can be set up against your business or it can be set up against your, the, the equity in your primary residence, which is known as a HELOC. And rates on these are typically way lower than, than commercial lending rates. So you know, they're going to range anywhere from two and a half sometimes. That's introductory rates. But typically prime, like right now as we speak, prime is three and a quarter. You can get a two and a half rate with some of our local banks. And then that will adjust after 12 months to prime plus zero. Um, Depending on who you're, you know, who you're borrowing from, it can be prime plus zero, prime plus one, prime plus two. Um, but typically, you're going to see those under five percent, which is going to be cheaper than, you know, than bank financing. Um, which brings us to bank financing. So, if you have good credit and you have a job and and uh, can put a down payment down, there are several community banks here in town that are eager to lend on on real estate. You're typically going to find a 75 to 85 percent loan to value, and if you don't know what that means, that means you're going to have to put down 15 to 25 percent to get into this investment, and then the remainder, the 75 to 85 percent, will be the, what the mortgage will cover. Uh, some things to note: these do require an appraisal. They do require good credit. Uh, you're going to see a rate anywhere from five to six and a half right now, and this is in 2014, so these rates could change and probably will soon. And you'll see a 30 to 45 day closing, which that's important because if you're trying to buy a wholesale deal where you're uh, someone's assigning a contract or if you're trying to bid at the courthouse steps, this is not going to work for you. You're going to need to look for other financing strategies. The next uh, finance strategy is hard money. 
And if you're not familiar with the hard money lender, it's, it's essentially a private equity lender. They, they pull their own capital or other people's capital and arbitrage that. So, you know, they'll, they'll charge a one to 5% origination fee, depending on who the lender is and, and what they feel their risk level is and working with you. And that usually comes down to experience. If this is your first deal, you're probably going to pay five points. Um, some hard money lenders will do 100% loan to value. Some will only do up to 80, and that's typically of the of your as-is value. Um, some do require an appraisal. Some don't. Uh, there's typically not a credit requirement. The the one that I have that will do 9.95 percent. They actually they they require a 680 credit score or above, and they vet you, uh, make sure you you know you know what you're doing. Uh, but the rates you're not usually going to see anything below 10 and you'll rarely see anything above 15. So there's kind of a, a 10 to 15 percent interest rate range there. So you'll pay, you know, the, the origination points up and on the front end, and those usually get folded in and then you'll pay that high rate. So this is not a loan that you want to use for, you know, a, a long amount of time. The terms on these will typically range from 90 days to six months. There are hard money lenders that will let you go 12 months, but you need to have the end game in mind if you're going to use hard money. That needs to be refinancing under a commercial loan if it's a buy and hold property or selling the asset if it's a flip. So this is, you know, this is definitely short-term financing. Um, one of the best ways to finance any real estate investment, whether you're just getting started or if you're, you know, a seasoned investor is, is private money. You know, we all know attorneys, doctors, people who are way too busy to go out and invest on their own but they're making a modest three to five percent return on their, you know, their ETF dividend fund, mutual fund, or or whatever, wherever they're investing their money passively. Um, you can show them a way to to essentially have zero risk in investing in your business to uh, to to flip homes or or build a rental portfolio. So the great thing about private money is is together you and the lender can set the terms. So you can decide on how long the loan is, what the interest rate is, if there are any origination fees or points. Typically, you're not going to pay points on private money. Uh, typically, you're going to get 100% LTV, and, and most private lenders will finance the, the asset acquisition as well as the repair. Um, most people aren't going to ask you for an appraisal, and it's based more on relationship than it is on credit, credit score. Um, Rates, you know, I know guys that will loan money at as little as 5%. Personally, I, I loan mine at 15% because I can. Uh, I don't charge points, but I do charge 15%, and it's on a commercial note. So it, it really just depends on the structure of the deal and, and what your relationship is with the lender as far as what you can get. Um, the last thing we'll talk about on, on financing is retirement accounts. Now, this is something that, a lot of investors, and I would venture to say 99% of realtors overlook, uh, you can actually access your retirement accounts to build your portfolio and invest in, in either strategy, whether you're flipping or, or buying long-term buy and hold. Uh, you can use a self-directed IRA. Now, uh, there's two different kinds of self-directed IRA. One is a custodian control. If you are just getting into this or you are a shitty accountant, I would highly recommend this. Um, the way this is set up, you have a custodian that controls the flow of funds. So whenever you buy a house, pay a contractor, buy materials, anything like that, they have to approve that payment. So you'll have you'll, your flip will be set up on draws. You'll have X amount to buy the home, X amount to rehab the home. And, and you'll have draws set up a lot like a lender would do if, if it were a construction to perm loan. Um, I recommend this for anybody who's never flipped a house or never built a portfolio or is, is just not very good at, at managing money. And the reason is because if you commingle funds or you break a rule, if you do business with a, a non-related or excuse me, a, a non-qualified person, uh, and, and I'm not going to get that deep into that, but you need to know what a non-qualified person is um, and what, what you can and cannot do with this. If you do something wrong, you can trigger a taxable event on your entire portfolio. And if you're late in your career and you have a half a million bucks, 
a taxable event can be devastating. So just make sure that, that if you don't have a lot of experience and you don't know everything there is to know about the tax laws, make sure you got somebody looking over your shoulder. And this is a great, great tool for that. Um, the other structure you can use for a self-directed IRA is an IRA LLC. And this is actually how I've set my retirement accounts up. The IRA actually owns 100% of the shares in a Virginia LLC, and that LLC just happens to invest in real estate. One of the great things about this is it can invest in anything. You can invest in stocks, gold, cash, uh, you know, forex trading. You can use that for anything. But the way mine's set up, I set it up solely for real estate because that's what I know. Like I'm, you know, I've, I'm, I know enough to protect myself. Um, if you're a seasoned investor. <clears throat> and you, you know, you know everything you need to know. You've learned your lessons. This is a great way to, to, basically, open the open the gate on that money that's been fenced in by federal tax law. Um, the the great thing about this structure, you simply go to one of your community banks, open up a, a business checking account. The the custodian will will fund a hundred percent of the IRA funds into that checking account. And from that point on, it's just like a line of credit. You have total checkbook control. Um, again, this is not recommended for you know novice or beginner investors. And the reason is, if you simply made one wrong deposit and put personal funds into that account, or if you made a withdrawal, uh, the story that the attorney who helped me set mine up and educated me on this, he had a client who accidentally pulled the wrong debit card out at Dairy Queen and bought a blizzard for his son for like three ninety nine, and he had about a $70,000 federal tax liability because he bought a blizzard. So something as simple as that, just a stupid mistake of pulling a debit card out while he was in the drive through could have cost him 70000 Now, he very quickly put that money back the, <laughs> and, and just kind of swept it under the rug, and he'll probably never be caught, but technically he, he did you know, violate the rules and, and could have been liable for that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's just a quick rundown on financing. Now here a little bit about what we bring to the table as expert advisors. As I said, I've, I've, I've flipped homes. I've wholesaled homes. I still buy and sell homes. I, I loan money to other investors who are just getting started. Um, I actually flip homes with hedge fund money. I've got friends who, who are managers of hedge funds, and, and we use that money to, to buy and flip houses uh, around the country. Um, we, we can bring you wholesale and off-market deals. You know, we, we network with, with all the guys that are in the trenches doing the wholesaling and, and stuff that, that never sees the light of, of day on MLS. These are typically deals that are the reason they don't go on MLS in 24 to 48 hours. And we've always got a pulse on those. I would say at, at any given time, we can show you four to six homes that are off market that you could buy at, at pennies of what you would pay on MLS. Um, we have over 100 investors right now on our, our landlord and rehabber list. So every time a, a great deal comes in, <clears throat> excuse me, comes in, we're going to push that out to our list. Um, we know how to value assets. I mean, it, I think we probably proved that in this presentation. You know, we understand financing, we understand finance, and, and we can really help guide you through that process. Um, we've got a thorough understanding of, of how investors finance assets, and we can introduce you to lenders to get started. So if you don't know which banks to be working with, where to get started with hard money, um, or how private equity works you know we, we can help you get started with with your strategy there uh, we can help you ex estimate construction and repair costs when starting out so you know we've got enough experience just walking through a home much this room costs this much you got a total total budget of x if we pay this you'll see this kind of return so we can help you with that i mean that's something you're definitely going to want to learn as you get into this but it's something we can really help you with on the front end um we can introduce you to contractors and trades that we've we've vetted and approved. We're very careful on who makes it on this list. You know, you, you basically get one chance to, to get on the list and stay on the list. Uh, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Um, so we've got general contractors, painters, roofers, carpenters, electricians, uh, you name it, mold remediation, uh, foundation. We, we've actually... <laughs> 
we've, we've, I think we hold the record for the largest foundation job in Roanoke Valley. So we can introduce you to those folks, which can save you uh, an enormous amount of time. Um, we have proprietary tools to help you evaluate deals. Uh, I have a flip analysis sheet that I've built. It's hard to tell how many hours I have in that sheet. It'll kind of, it's, you know, and as I've learned along the, along the way, I've continued to add to the sheet and it, it'll really help you assess your risk and show you in black and white exactly what the investment's going to look like and hopefully what the return will be. And then a buy and hold sheet the same way. So if you're thinking about building one unit or 100 units, we have a sheet that's scalable to, to fit, you know, to, to fit this scenario. And we can share those with you as well if, as long as you're clients of ours. Um, how, how do we understand and help you build your strategy? So there's, there's key questions that we're going to ask, and it's not because we're nosy or just don't know what to say. It's, you know, these are all things that help us help you. And if you're not ready to answer these, then, you know, go find somebody who, who will just walk you around and show you houses because we, we're, we take this very seriously. You know, we, we want to, we want to have this relationship with you two decades from now and say, you know, we help make this guy a million bucks or his first million bucks and you know all of his subsequent millions thereafter so we're we're gonna ask uncomfortable questions at times and even if we don't know you we're gonna ask that because how can we properly you know advise you if we don't really understand where you're coming from so some of those you know are you working with cash or financing we need to know that up front and if you don't know yet then you need to back up because that's something you need to figure out you know, if you're working with cash, there's going to be certain types of homes we can show you. If you're working with financing, we're much more limited in what we can show you. Uh, another good question, <coughs> excuse me, what's your current strategy? So if you're looking to, if you call us on a $50,000 house, we need to know, are you looking at renting this or are you looking at flipping? Because even though it might seem like an attractive price, and we do this, believe me, every week I talk people out of buying my listings. Because we'll have a $50,000 house and it looks great to somebody who just bought a course. But the reality is if they buy that and try to flip it, they're going to get stuck holding the bag. And if I don't say that up front, you know, our number 10 core value, candor is a virtue. So if I think you're going to lose your ass in an investment, I'm going to step up and say that. So we need to understand what your strategy is. You know, if, if you're a landlord, you're going to have a totally different buying criteria than if you're a flipper. Um, how many deals have you done so far? You know, this is a good qualifying question for us. It helps us know if, if you need help. If you tell me, Chad, hey, I, you know, I did, a, I did a dozen or so last year, and, you know, I'm kind of new. Well, I know you're modest, and you know what the hell you're doing. If you say, well, you know, we were just starting to look, and, and you know, really got this guy mentoring me, then I know you probably need some leadership. You, you need someone to say, to really help you drill down on your strategy. So that's something, you know, it's a question that's going to come up in every conversation. Um, do you have an agent who understands your strategy and knows what to look for? You know, this is something that, uh, as an agent, I have a lot of respect for my peers, at least the ones that, that educate themselves and, and, you know, treat this as, as a professional service. I don't have much respect for the ones that just expect a paycheck because they go to church with a guy who happens to flip houses. So, you know, if you're working with an agent and they don't understand all the stuff that, that we've gone through today, I, I encourage you to rethink who you're working with because, you know, if, if you have the right agent, if you have somebody who really understands your strategy, they're, they're going to know what opportunities to bring you and they're not just going to send you a list of crap off of MLS. They're going to say, you know what, here's a house you should buy and here's why, here's what it's worth, here's what I think you have to put into it. And, you know, they can really put you in a position to to really, really build wealth if, if you're working with the right person. Um, another question is we always ask, you know, if, if we show you opportunities that fit what you're looking for, would you like us to be your advisor throughout the process? And, you know, that's if we enter into a relationship and we help you buy a home, there, there's an expectation that, you know, we'll be there to resell it. Because not only do, do, do we know and have great, great systems in place for acquisitions, we have what I believe is, is the best selling system in, in the Valley. Um, for our own flips, we typically list below market value. We attract multiple offers and we, we usually set the high comp. So, you know, we sell homes quickly, we sell them for top dollar and we do a hell of a good job marketing them. So these are things we're going to talk about. If, you know, if you're working with us as a buyer's agent, we would love to have the opportunity to, you know, to help you sell that home for top dollar and, and maximize your returns. Um, 
so the three re the resources I spoke about earlier, these are three that you know I wish when I first got started I would have known about these three things. Uh, BiggerPockets.com is an online forum of I think uh, close to eight hundred thousand investors. There is more free information on here from everything from a guy who has no idea what he's talking about to the most seasoned investors in the country and take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, the great thing is they have a uh, kind of a scoring system. So uh, when you're more engaged and you post more and people vote for you as a professional, you'll be able to see kind of a credibility badge beside of, of each person. So, you know, if, if they're on there, if they're just a clown, that's, you know, just talking, pulling, information out of the blue or if they actually know what they're talking about and they're speaking from experience um, another great resource that that's relatively new like in, in the last 12 months or so is a podcast that i listen to called house flipping hq um, the guy that, that hosts this i'm pretty sure his name is justin williams he is an awesome interviewer he, he's a great podcast host and he gets the best talent in the country i mean he's pulling guys that are doing hundreds of deals a year and I mean they, they know this and you'll learn more from this podcast than you ever will from any book or any guru course so take you know get this on your phone and, and as Tony Robbins would put it you know no extra time in your net time you need to be listening to these podcasts and just absorbing as much of this as you can if you're serious about it um, another really good resource and, and this is a little Flip to Freedom is, is a podcast that's done by a guy named Sean Terry out of Arizona, and he is awesome. I mean, you talk about providing value first. The guy just gives away the farm. He teaches everything there is to know about wholesaling, marketing, reselling. Um, just a, a phenomenal investor. He's, he's he, you know, of the, the abundance mindset. He gives it all away. So if you haven't Check these out. Be sure and, and you know save bigger pockets as, as a you know bookmark this and save it as a favorite. Get the House Flipping HQ and Flip to Freedom podcast on your phone. You'll learn more from that from those three resources than anything else I could possibly direct you to. Um, so now we get down to you know, are, are you interested in working with us? If you are, you can call the number here. It's five four zero nine 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 six zero eight four. And uh, schedule a free investor consultation. What we'll do is, is we'll sit down. We'll we'll help you create a clear strategy, give you some some resources to educate yourself, get your financing strategy in order. We'll start looking at homes that fit the strategy we've laid out. We can make an offer, close on the house, and execute. And once you've executed, you know if depending on if if you're a flipper, we can help you sell that home quickly. If you've built up a portfolio, you know, right now we, we're helping one of our investors sell uh, a portfolio of, of 77 homes. So no matter what your strategy, you know, we can help you out. Um, so anyways, hopefully this has been helpful. This number here, you can always reach me directly at 540-999-6084. Our website is roanokehomehub.com, which is another great resource for uh off-market deals, uh, investor searches. We've got you know REO lists, short sale lists, and and other other multifamily and investor searches. So, thanks a lot for your time today, and let me know if there's any way we can help you improve your life through real estate.